Relative dating techniques only take us so far. Ideally, we want to be able to directly date either the sediments themselves or even the fossils so that we have some definitive point in time as our starting point. Now, the most well-established and well-known direct dating technique is radiometric dating techniques. These techniques take advantage of the fact that naturally occurring compounds within the Earth decay over time from one isotope to another isotope. The most commonly known of these is carbon dating, which involves the natural decay of carbon-16 to carbon-14 over time. Now, by looking at actually the relative components of these two isotopes of carbon within a given soil sediment, we're able to determine how long those soils have been there, how long they've been decaying from one kind to another. The different kind of radiometric dating techniques have different windows of time period in which they work effectively for. Carbon, for example, has a relatively short half-life, meaning the time in which you go from basically losing half of one isotopic component takes about 5,700 years, which seems like a long time, but in the scale of human evolutionary history in the human fossil record is relatively short. As a result, carbon dating usually only works for periods up to about, say, 40,000 years in the past. At that point, the amount of carbon-16 within a given sample is so small to make the technique not very accurate when it comes to dating. However, there are other common isotopes, such as isotopes of argon, potassium, uranium, and lead, which span hundreds of millions of years, because they have much longer half-lives. So oftentimes, these are components which allow us to directly date, especially volcanic sediments, within ancient uh, stratigraphic contexts, including ones that go back 2 million, 4 million, 6 million, even many hundreds of millions of years in the past. There are a number of other direct dating techniques that take advantage of the fact that Oftentimes, when rocks are superheated and then both cool quickly and become buried very quickly, they preserve certain kinds of properties that allow us to go back and sequence them. For example, optically stimulated luminescence, or thermoluminescence, takes advantage of the fact that certain rocks or certain materials within rocks have actually been buried and not exposed to the sunlight for a long period of time. By chemically treating those rocks, we're actually able to determine how long it was that they were last exposed to light. So optically stimulated ther luminescence, thermoluminescence, allow us to get at that materials contained within those compounds, basically to determine how old they are. Other absolute dating techniques include ESR, or electron spin resonance. This takes advantage of the fact that, again, when something has been superheated and then cools very quickly, the electrons within the minerals within that rock actually preserve certain kinds of properties. By examining those properties, we're able to determine how old these, these rocks are. So using a combination of both relative and absolute dating techniques, we're able oftentimes to get very good details on how old a specific fossil is, or at least how old that fossil locality is. This temporal information is a very important component of the overall evolutionary model and evolutionary information available to us from any given site. One important thing to understand about humans and primates is that we change throughout our life. While this doesn't represent evolution, it's still something important for our understanding of evolution. For example, we're not born into our adult forms. We're born as infants, we pass through childhood, eventually into adolescence, and eventually into adulthood, and even later adulthood. Primates in general go through these same kind of periods. Studying the development of humans throughout their life is what we refer to as life history. Humans and primates share a common developmental pattern throughout life. We can illustrate this at a first level by thinking about simply growth and how humans and primates tend to grow throughout their life. So primates and humans both tend to have just single births. So they devote a lot of resources to that single birth. And at the time of birth, if we use that birth as the starting point here on our axis, and think about the pace of growth, basically how rapidly individuals are growing at that time, when new babies are born, they grow very, very quickly at first. And over time, over the first few months, that begins to slow down and they enter into childhood. Most humans, or most primates, I should say, and humans have an adolescent growth spurt at some point where they begin to grow faster again and then growth gradually peters out as you enter into adulthood. So that this growth curve through life um, is fairly characteristic of primates in general, although primates differ in how much of an adolescent growth spurt they have, whether males and females both have an adolescent growth spurt, and the exact timing of these events. For example, childhood in humans is very extended. And in general, in apes, childhood is also quite extended. 
One of the things that distinguishes humans and apes from the rest of the primates is how much energy and how much value we devote to our childhood. Now, from an evolutionary standpoint, this might not make a lot of sense. You might think it would be better to be born and simply immediately reproduce and produce lots of offspring. However, part of what characterizes the adaptation of higher primates, including humans, is valuing a lot of energy towards childhood. Childhood is a period where we develop a lot of complexity and potential. We learn things. We learn how to communicate with other social creatures. We develop complex social behaviors. These, it turns out, are all very important for the overall pattern of survival and reproduction that we see in the primates. If we think about humans relative to the other primates, humans tend to have very dependent offspring. When we're born, we're not capable of doing many things. However, we grow very, very rapidly those first several months and even those first several years, especially our brain, actually. Our brain, because it eventually ends up so large, does a lot of development during that early phase of our growth period. And we have a very clearly established adolescent growth spurt after this extended childhood period, but even then we continue to develop and mature until basically late teenage or early 20s usually. Usually our skeleton has stopped growing by the time we're about 20. Um, sometimes a little bit earlier than that, sometimes a little bit later than that. However, this pattern of development is also an important evolutionary life history characteristic of our species. The fact that we spend so much time period in this pre-reproductive growing state suggests how much we really devote to our final adult selves and the complexity of that final adult self.